Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, you're fired. The manager had a feeling that it was coming when he was called to his wealthy boss's office. Now he just heard the words, you're fired. He had been specifically hired to manage the wealth of this man, and yet the manager hadn't done such a good job managing. In fact, he really hadn't done anything at all. And so there he sat in his wealthy boss's office as his boss recounted the record of irresponsibility and unfaithfulness on his part. And the manager made no excuses because, frankly speaking, there weren't any excuses. He got up, he walked out of his boss's office, and as he made his way down to his very nice, comfortable office that he had enjoyed but certainly had not earned in any way, he began to wonder to himself, what was next? Manual labor? Yeah, that didn't seem so appealing. Standing on the corner with a cardboard sign, begging for money? That seemed even less appealing. What was he going to do now that he lost his job? And then it came to him. He rushed back to his office. He sat down behind his desk. He picked up his phone and he began calling people, frantically calling one after another. The first person he talked to was somebody that owed his boss much money. So much so that the manager decided that if the man immediately paid for even half of the loan, he made a deal that the man wouldn't have to pay for any more. Well, the man thought that this was a no-brainer. What a great deal. And so he immediately agreed to it. The manager picked up the phone and he called the next person who owed some money to his boss. And he said to the man that if he immediately paid back 80% of the loan, that the manager would forgive the remaining of that loan. Again, the person jumped at the opportunity to cancel that debt, and he agreed. And so the manager went down the list, calling one person after the next, making all of these great deals with people. The purpose for the manager making these great deals was really twofold. First of all, he hoped to recoup at least part of the wealthy man's money. But secondly, and probably more important to the manager, was that as he made these deals, he hoped to make a few friends along the way that would give him a few favors in the future so that if he lost his job, that he could continue to live his comfortable life. Well, guess what? Everything went just as the manager had hoped. In fact, even better. Because the next time that the manager made his way down to his wealthy boss's office, the wealthy man commended and praised the manager for his wide and shrewd use of the wealth. And the manager continued to live his comfortable life. That was the story that Jesus told. He told it to a group of his followers who had gathered around him, as well as a few wealthy Pharisees that were interspersed in that crowd. And then Jesus says something that at first might be a little shocking and surprising to us. Jesus says to this group of people, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Hold on for a second. Is Jesus really telling us what I think that he's telling us here? Is Jesus really saying that we should act like this irresponsible, lazy, unfaithful manager? Well, yeah. And no. Uh, no, Jesus is not condoning, nor is he encouraging Christians to act like that lazy manager. But yes, Jesus is telling us that there is, there is something that we can learn from that manager. That there is something that we can learn from the unbelieving, non-Christian world when it comes to our use of the money that God has given to us. Just like that manager suddenly put to good use the money entrusted to him, making the most of what he had to work with, so Jesus also tells you and me to put our money to good use and to use, 
to the fullest extent, what God has entrusted to us. God calls his people to be wise and shrewd in the use of their money, just like the people of this world are, while at the same time recognizing that our purpose and our perspective money is going to be vastly different than the world around us. You probably noticed that in Jesus' story. Did you notice what the purpose was for the shrewd manager to suddenly start using the wealthy master's money shrewdly? Listen again to what he says. So that people will welcome me into their houses. In other words, it was all about having a comfortable life. And isn't that so often the purpose behind people's pursuit of money and the things that money purchases? We find people, as we look around, working extremely hard, almost to killing themselves, valiantly trying to maintain their wealth and trying to make it grow, but many times for one purpose. And that is so that they can have a more comfortable life for themselves or maybe for somebody else. To be able to purchase that next bigger home, that newer car, to build up that bigger bank account, to be able to retire a few years earlier, to hopefully be able to purchase that longer family vacation. And sure, those things might bring some temporary satisfaction and joy. And you and I might even benefit from their hard work and their ingenuity. But sometimes, what is the focus? The focus remains solely on this life, the here and the now. In fact, Jesus reminds us of that when he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, when it's gone, the money and things that money buys, they will one day be gone. Someone once said that you, you never find a U-Haul or an armored truck following the hearse to the cemetery. And it's true. The money, the possessions that we have in this life, they are only temporary. One day they will all be given to somebody else. The world recognizes the temporary nature of this life and so they work hard. They put money to its fullest use also that life can be as comfortable as possible for as long as possible. But sadly, it's all because this, this life is all that they have to hold on to. Jesus reminds us that our perspective and our purpose for money is going to be vastly different than the world around us. Yes, like the world around us, we too realize that the money and possessions we have, they are only temporary. But unlike the world, we recognize that God has given to us something that goes much further than the grave. Something that actually goes on into eternity. Jesus reminds us of that when he says that we have been given what he calls true riches. These riches are not temporary. They cannot be stolen by thieves or blown away by a tornado or wrecked by floodwaters or burned up by fire. These true riches that Jesus describes, they don't depend upon a rising and falling stock market. They don't depend upon the type of job that you might have. They, they don't depend upon the, the kind of car you drive or where you attended college. These true riches are what the Apostle Peter describes as an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. These are the true riches of the heavenly blessings that Jesus has won for us and that he has given to every Christian through faith. These are the true riches of eternal peace and perfection of heaven's home, these are the true riches that affect our view and also our use of money. And yes, I did say use of money. Because Jesus never says that the Christian should not use money or that they should stay away from it or that it is inherently evil and sinful, no. 
Jesus just tells us to understand the proper relationship with money. In other words, to use the words of Jesus, to understand who is the master and who is the servant. Jesus later on says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Pretty simple, right? I mean, God has given to us money and possessions all in varying amounts. And God gives us that money and those possessions to be our servants, to be used by us. Faithfully and fully and yes, even shrewdly in the ways that God outlines for us in his word. To use our money for the personal cares that we have, for the physical needs that we or the people around us have but especially to be used to advance the message of the gospel so that other people might come to faith in Jesus and after this life receive those true and eternal riches of heaven. Now that is the proper relationship between the Christian and money that Jesus describes. But how often does that relationship get mixed up? How often does the servant become the master and the master become the servant? I mean, there's a reason why we hear people call it the almighty dollar. It's because money can be awfully powerful and influential at times. Just think of how often greed and jealousy and a lack of contentment drives our decisions and our actions, affects our attitudes, how we perceive the world, even how we perceive ourselves. We become reluctant to share with somebody in need what we have been given because we think to ourselves, you know what, I worked hard for this. Why should somebody else benefit from what I worked for? And if I help that person, eh, they'll probably just waste it and find themselves in the same poor position once again. We push off bringing our first fruit offerings to the Lord Because we realize that if we didn't, then we would have to delay eh, the purchase of that next iPhone, that next designer purse, uh, family vacation, or or we just want to save just a little bit more. How often do we cling to our checkbooks and our credit cards and the things that they buy as if in some way they define us, they make us valuable and important? Do we ever find ourselves looking down on somebody who doesn't have as much as we do and wondering to ourselves, I wonder what that person did wrong to find themselves in such a meager position? Like an untrained, unruly dog that is dragging its master all over the neighborhood and where people look at them and wonder who's walking who. How often does the dollar drag us around in the places that we should not go to do things that we should not do to travel down paths that only lead us further away from Christ and from his blessings you might expect that God would just take a look at us call us into his office and say that's it you're fired You have been irresponsible and you have been unfaithful with what I have entrusted to you for this life. And you know what? It's true. God has every right to do so when it comes to our sinful mismanagement of the things that he has given to us. But instead of you're fired, God in his grace says, you are forgiven. I have paid your debt in full. What you and I owe to God for every one of our sinful wanderings, God's Son Jesus has paid on our behalf. The cost is described by the Apostle Peter, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, that you were bought from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers but rather with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God gave his son's life 
to pay what we owe to God for every one of our sins. The hugely hellish mountain of debt that would otherwise crush the sinner for eternity, God has removed, and in its place, he has given to us the perfection, the faithfulness, and the righteousness of his son Jesus. You and I now possess through faith everything that makes us worthy of those true and everlasting riches of heaven. What a gracious, what a generous master you and I have in our Savior God. Someone who selflessly served us with his life so that we can gratefully serve him throughout our lives with all that he has entrusted to us. That's what drives the Christian. That's what drives you and me to use whatever amounts the Lord has entrusted to us in money and possessions to be used to glorify our God. What an awesome and powerful tool God has given to us in our money to be able to witness to the world around us of who our master truly is, of where we are headed by God's grace after this life. And yes, to gain many friends as we help and benefit the people around us so that they too may know of the generosity of God's love and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So that when our time here in this world is done and when all the things of this world are good and gone, that they too may join us in being welcomed into those eternal riches of heaven which Jesus has safely and securely held for us. May God grant it to us. For Jesus, our master, our generous and gracious God, amen.